Hello and welcome. My name is Ian Pelham Turner. And my name is Helena Shard. And together today we are doing the Great Britain Show in conjunction with the Voice of London on ALB UK Television. So we start today's show with news from Novak Djokovic, who at the moment has just been talking to the BBC, an exclusive to the BBC. So it's been seen in Britain and it's being seen right across the world at the same time. And he is saying he would rather forego winning any more championships if it means that he has to take the COVID jab in any description at all. What he is saying is he's not against inoculations, but for him, he must have the freedom of choice that is very, very necessary at the same time for all of this to happen as well. So at the moment, the reality is, is that they are looking at this. He is looking at this as well. Uh, and it may be that he may not be going to the Paris Open this year or to Wimbledon either. And even in America, where a lot of the conditions re really recall and require him to be having a jab at the same time, he may not be visiting America either this year. So the reality at the moment is, is that Novak Djokovic, who has got 20 world championships under his belt as a tennis player, may not be getting to this elusive 21st one, which would make him the top tennis champion ever. And so we're going to move on from Novak Djokovic this afternoon and really go to the Ukraine situation that's happening as well. Because now it is being reported that Russian troops or some tanks are going back onto their trailers and are being taken away from the borders with Ukraine itself. And so a lot of people are saying, is President Putin really playing around with what's going on? Uh, just for his own financial benefits or not. And some people are saying he was just after some money, he's got his money now, and so he's going to take his troops out of the front garden of Ukraine at the same time. So that's really the main news items uh, for myself. And now over to Helena. So I am going to give you some royal bites today uh, for my news. Um, we've just celebrated um, Valentine's Day, almost forgot that. Uh, and all you need is love. I'm sure you, everybody agrees that that's the case. And Her Majesty the Queen is revving up, obviously, for the Jubilee. But she has spotlighted some very fun activities with Sophie Countess of Wessex. Um, she's fabulous. And I think actually quite underrated. Um, she does a lot of work um, here in the UK. And just prior to Valentine's Day, she attended Shooting Star Children's Hospices event where she was seen doing some great creative activities. And this is a, um, uh, she's a patron for this charity um, and she has been now for a few years. And funnily enough, she even volunteers her times to the local charity shop that supports the, um, the hospice, which I think is lovely. Now, she's been seen, we saw her doing Makaton, um, and actually it, it was the Beatles' All You Need Is Love. And it's uh, the Makaton, if you don't know, it's, it's like a sign language. It's uh, using signs and symbols to help people communicate. And the charity supports um, families, babies, children, adults who have life limiting conditions and also supports the families greatly. So very excited to see her working hard as usual. And also the Duke of Cambridge, we've seen him in Dubai and he's been doing a grand job promoting Great Britain and also promoting positive Great Britain Plan the planet wise so for, for the future and um, he's very very much into that I mean that's a huge other topic but personally I'm very interested in the fact that he's a, a passionate camp campaigner for homelessness 
and he is patron of the biggest charity, which is Centrepoint. Um, this is something very, very close to his heart. Um, he's been patron since 2005, and in fact, it's his first first um, patronage from, and it was inherited from his mother, Prince, late Princess Diana. And she used to actually take them, that's Harry as well, Prince Harry, to, to visit um, Centrepoint. And they used to enjoy it. And, and the lovely thing about it is Prince William, in fact, goes there without the camera sometimes, just pops in to say hello. So that's always exciting to hear. And he, at the moment, is also thinking about possibly using part of the Duchess of uh, Cornwall estate to house the homeless. Now, this is a, a, a allegedly, I'm not quite sure how that would work out, but um, at least he's thinking about it. And he has been fighting for, for lots of housing. And at the moment, the good news is, is that Centrepoint have um, 33 pre-built modular homes, which are going to be lived in as from May. Now, this, I believe, is an answer to a crisis that we're in. We have so many um, people who are homeless at the minute. And this scheme, well, it's an independent living scheme. It's just a way to house um, people. And it will be up to 300 homes I think that will be available in uh, 2025. It is for people that are under 25 and it will give them five years of, of living really comfortably. Um, and it's a really, really positive story. So I'm sure everyone loves a bedtime story. I know I do, um, either being read it or reading it myself. And uh, coming to the end of Children's Mental Health Week, the Duchess of Cambridge has is the latest famous face to be reading a bedtime story on CBBS, which I have seen, and it is really, really lovely. So she's sat in this lovely intimate setting, uh, dressed casually outside, which is something that she always talks about that she does with her children. Um, obviously very good for mental health um, for children and adults alike. And she reads a story called The Owl Who Was Afraid of the Dark. Um, this obviously correlates with Mental Health Week, um, which is the theme of growing together. And the whole inference is that we all feel scared at some sometimes, but better to find out about these things before making a decision. And also with the help of others, we can ov obviously face these things and the worries. Um, so working with people always helps. It's a lovely, lovely thing that you can see on Catch Up and it's well worth a watch. I think, I mean, her passion um, really comes through and so many people have tuned in to see it. I think though, Tom Hardy has pipped the post um, as being the most viewed person who's done one of these bedtime stories. Um, but uh, yeah, very exciting. And that's a, a great end to children's mental health. And I will see you next week with my Royal Bites. Well done, Helena. I think that's uh, another tremendous piece of royal news again. And really, uh, you bring some great stories to our show at the same time. So well done. And now we're going to show a video to actually incite people to excite them to actually join the Red Cross charity in Britain. So let's watch the charity video. I have worked at the British Red Cross for over 11 years. I have been here for a year and a month. About four years now, just over. Just coming up to six years. 14 years. About four of us joined at the same time and everyone asked us what the environment was like. And I was like, everyone's really nice. And also lots of cake. People bring in cake, which is fantastic. We have a lot of young people that are coming in who are really enthusiastic. The Red Cross is a very well-known organisation, so I think it attracts some high-caliber individuals. Because it's a, a bigger and more established organisation, there are benefits that you might not otherwise get in another charity. There is a pension plan, there are all the childcare and health and sickness benefits that you may not get in, in a smaller charity. I think we do perpetuate that culture of ensuring that you do have an outside life. And I know that some people with children 
there's a good relationship with their managers where they can leave a bit early or start earlier. So we're not necessarily stuck to the 9.30, 5.30. We try to focus on ensuring that people are happy and able to perform at their best because they're happy, because they do. They are seen as people rather than just, you know, instruments of work. The opportunity for development is, is like no other place I've worked in really. I mean, you get the opportunity to see what other people are working on and to build your skills up in other areas that aren't directly related to you. You have all kinds of incredible opportunities to meet interesting people, to learn from interesting people. Yeah, and that can be in the more sort of formal uh, sort of training sense or in really great leadership programs. There's a lot of internal training courses that are run by the British Red Cross internally. So I've managed to get on quite a few of those, even basic things like Excel courses and things like that to help just develop your basic skills. Um, I've also done first aid courses and as a staff member there's a lot of opportunities to volunteer. I have stayed with the Red Cross because there's been such a range of opportunities available to me in the international development sector. Ba -do -ba -dum. <laughs> One of the best things, I would say, about working for the Red Cross is the people within it. I mean, that's our real strength. We've got such a heritage and such a culture, and people know the amazing work that we do. It's, you can't help but feel a sense of pride. It's working for one of the largest global humanitarian organisations in the world. People are always really interested, actually, to hear about what we actually do. People are always really surprised to find out that we're actually primarily a national domestic organisation with international aspects and obviously there's international parts of the organisation like the ICRC and the International Federation. You get to work on some really meaty issues around you know, climate change, around health and um, social care. You feel like you're part of something. You don't really feel like you're coming to work. You, know, you feel like you belong here. You know? So I think what a great place to be and that's why I'm still here. It's you know that you're making a difference and you're making a really broad difference across the entire world. I think that's why I should join and also the cake and the nice people. Um. But mostly, mostly the first bit, but also cake. Wasn't that the most wonderful it was so heartening. I just love it. I mean, obviously, the British Red Cross, an international humanitarian charity, so amazing because it's international. But, I mean, they've really got it right, haven't they? Because the That's staff right. are completely in alignment. They're sort of eating, breathing the whole British Red Cross. And I think, you know, that the amount of training they're giving as well and the amount of job opportunities is fabulous. It is fabulous. Well, we're going to now take a very short break um, and then we're going to bring another fabulous person on our show today, Michael Spooner, a wonderful business consultant and someone who is really working with disabilities and getting disabled people into jobs in Britain today. So stay tuned. And welcome back to the second half of the show now. And now we are with one of Britain's top business consultants, Michael Spooner. Welcome, Michael. Oh, hi, Ian. Thank you for having me on the show. And, 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 and thank you, Helena, as well. Yeah. So, you. Michael, 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 now you are a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of information, so much inspiration. I, you know, I could go on applauding you, but I just, just give us a little bit of history 
um, really about your um, your challenges. If you can share that with yeah. us. Oh yeah. Um, well, I was uh, I'm a registered blind person, but I was born blind for the first two years of my life, and then uh, I got my sight back at two years. Yeah, two years old. I had a a big operation uh, thanks to the NHS, our, our lovely National Health Service. Uh, and then I lost my sight at 13, got it back at 16, and then it went again at 21. So I've, I've had eyesight, no eyesight, eyesight, no eyesight. So it's been up and down like a yo-yo. But I mean, and then for the last 30, five years or 30 something years i don't know how many years yeah 35 years i've had my eyesight's been the same way i've not had an eyesight but i've managed to the good thing is i've managed to sustain work for 32 out of the 36 years i've managed to um, you know get on and have a full life and a full independent life so i've, I've had things have been good up and down but uh, i can't really complain about it helena it's been good. And Michael, you, you are currently working with Croydon Vision, and I know it's a very big campaign as well. Uh, and I understand it's trying to get more people with sight difficulties into work. So can you really give us a, a, a major insight into this whole charity campaign that you're working on right now? Yeah. Well, what it is, is because I've, I, because I've looked back and I'm now... 56 looking backwards looking back on my life Ian and I'm I'm looking at and saying well how did I sustain myself when 75% of blind and visually impaired people are, are unemployed uh, since, and we've got figures since 1991 Ian so I wanted to know what can I do to contribute working with the not-for-profit charitable sectors to try and do something about it. And so I, I, I was approached by Croydon Vision, which is a charity uh, working with blind and visually impaired people. They wanted me to be, an, originally to be an ambassador for them. And I said, and then they talk, I spoke to um, the chief executive officer there. She was, uh, and her, um, her key member of staff, Odette, was saying to me, um, we, we've got 200 members of working age that we cannot serve or we cannot support and we want some help with helping them to get into work or into a, a better career position. And so they came, so, so, so then we, 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 we went into a partnership. Uh, I worked, so I'm a you know, commercial consultancy, worked with Croydon Vision, which is a charity, a, a fantastic partnership and then vision works was born in out of that process so we we created the vision works program and it's an employ, employability program and we do intensive support help guidance advice uh training one-to-one -one, um coaching with blind uh people and visually impaired people and we're going to try to take them from a to b move them from a to b because it's all about momentum uh, and getting them closer to the labour market. And what we call, the word is work readiness, is the thing, Ian. Mm. So we try to get them work ready and get them to take those really difficult steps into work. So is, is the uniqueness of yeah. what you offer as compared to government or other agencies, yeah. Yeah. is that what you've just said, the one-to-one yeah. -one help and, and the momentum yes. rather than just leaving right i get that i'm curious as well michael because um uh, you know more and more women are now setting up businesses yeah and i'm just curious because you say that 75 percent um unemployment rate for blind, blind and visually yeah. impaired people is there a sort of female statistic male statistic within that um yes the, yeah i think there's um i would say more more women are more orientated towards business or in employment than men. I think uh, definitely there's a, a bias towards women. Uh, men are, are less, are more challenged. And certainly the unemployment rate, I would say there's more men unemployed than women. In, in, in fact, the UK labor market, there's actually more women working than men. So there's more oh. women in the, in, the, in the labor market, there's more women in the labor market than men. Uh, in, in the United Kingdom 
Uh, and so I, I think there is a, a slight bias towards women. In, and, and, and certainly amongst blind and vision impaired people, it's definitely more women than men uh, are more likely to work. But uh, it doesn't, that's not any uh, disrespect towards uh, the, the men. Uh, it's, just that the, it's just the way the nature of the way the profile of work and the type of jobs, it more lends towards female than male, really, I would say. Interesting. Do, do you yes, think, um, I mean, uh, Helen and I have worked a lot with um, uh, mm. charities and especially uh, and working with people who've got uh, different disabilities as well. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think people with disabilities, they try even harder because they really respect uh, being employed. Uh, mm. They understand the difficulties that uh, are being overcome. Uh, they find that companies mm. who are w working with them, they respect this even more. And do you find they give 200%, do you think, yeah. uh, to an employer? Yeah. Uh, well, look, I think any disabled person, regardless of the disability, Ian and Helena, it, you're going to have to put more work in, more effort in, uh, more of your heart into the work. And I think... Uh, if, if employers are listening to this broadcast, I want them to understand that uh, if you employ a disabled person, you're going to get 110%. You're going to get the extra percent out of them because they're going to work a little bit harder because they first, having a job is precious. Uh, uh, having a job is uh, uh, hard won. And then having the job is something that they're going to really work for you hard. So, so I, I would say to employers, um, really focus on if you do employ a disabled person or you, you have a vacancy that you want to do. The, I think there's the two tick symbol, which Job Centre Plus has or the government has. I think you should earmark it for a disabled person. That's what I would urge people. But yes, they do work harder, Ian. They do... Uh, push harder and and they do concentrate more and they do and they do appreciate the job but you know what they need support still uh, they need good line management they need good management in the organization and they need to the employers need to do reasonable adjustments because the law says so and they need to do it so we do need certain things to happen but yes they do push harder I would say and that's my experience Michael, what about yeah. general employment conditions in the economy? Um, you know, obviously yeah. COVID and everything. Will yeah. business bounce back? Is it bouncing back? Yes. Well, we, we know that unemployment is about 4%. We know the economy is bouncing back slowly, but we've got a big inflation rate. We've got a very tight labour market. We've got massive vacancy rates. We've got lots and lots of jobs. There's 100,000 jobs in the NHS. We've got lots of jobs out there. Uh, so that it's a tight labour market and it's a complex labour market and it's kind of unusual because we're not used to this <coughs> kind of structure in terms of work. So general employment, it's a complex, uh, but there are jobs there and we've just lost a million people through Brexit. We just lost one million people just gone back to Europe. Uh, we've we've got a, a very tight complex labor market which means when you when you employ somebody is coming somebody else is losing that job and that's the problem what we have in a tight labor market so it's really difficult and and when you look at it in a case of vision works or a a you know vulnerable people or disabled people that are looking for work they compete the competition is quite intense and quite harsh really and so we're going to have to give them even more help to get into work, Helena. That's really what we've got to do. Mm. And Michael, just to drill down a little bit more into Croydon Vision, yeah. Helena and I were talking just before we came on, and uh, if, if we've understood this correctly, over yeah. 200 people in Croydon have some uh, visual impairment. There seems to be a lot of concentration of, of people. Um, is there a reason behind that at all? Oh, no, 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 no. Um, Croydon, was one of the original well first back 100 years Croydon Vision and the organization has been there over a hundred years if not more than a hundred years and I think Croydon was 
originally out of London, and that was one of the places where, after the First World War, in a lot of blind people who had um, came out of the First World War with mustard gas, which made you go blind. A lot of them, I think, a lot of them came to Croydon uh, and 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 visit. You know, uh, was was uh, I was stationed there, so you get a cluster of blind people because there's a lot of blind jobs for blind people uh, back in the day after the 1920s, 30s and 40s. So I think Croydon Vision is a very old organisation. It's been there a long time. It, it, it usually helped older disabled people, but what they're interested in now, I think, is working age uh, blind and visually impaired people, which they're trying to serve. And they've approached my organisation MA Spooner Limited, you know, we're a business consultancy. So they approached me to help them as a prominent blind person out there in the community to help them to really do something about this intractable problem. It's a problem that's been going on, Ian, since 1991. We've had the Disability Discrimination Act, we've had legislation, we've had the Equality Act 2010, and we still can't get disabled people to get a better deal out of employment as able-bodied people do. And, and particularly blind people, that 75% unemployment rate, it's the sort of thing that we would never allow women, 75% of women to be unemployed, 75% of black people to be unemployed. We wouldn't allow it, Ian. And we, and blind people, uh, uh, it's, it's something that the government, successive governments have allowed unemployment rate of 75% to be since 1991 and I, I, I just feel that I want to do something about it because I'm looking back at my life and I've said well I've worked for 32 years what have I done uh, to make it work and so I'm looking back in terms of my successes or, or, or my ability to sustain myself and I'm saying I want to contribute to the, to the problem and, and work with all the charities. I'm going to I'm going to be contacting RNIB. I'm going to be contacting London Vision, as well as Croydon Vision and other organisations to try and work with different charities, uh, Ian, to to try and contribute to this process. Michael, just, I, Michael, I love the way that you you talk about your successes. I love yeah. that because that is so positive and yeah. that's brilliant. And you'll relay that to people you're working with. Um, more and more people are, are setting up their own businesses or trying to work towards doing that. Do you think visually impaired people, there are people also wanting to set up their own business? Yes, yes. Well, well look, because the, the labour market has all these barriers that stop disabled people or, or visually impaired people from going into work, they're more likely to, uh, in fact, you'll find the Office for National Statistics will show that there's a higher proportion disproportionate proportion of disabled people and blind people working for themselves compared to <clears throat> being employees because the labour market barriers are so intense and so high and so people do not tend to work for themselves so you'll find that you know it's not just disabled people it's ethnic minorities lots of people tend to work for themselves in, in a slightly higher numbers than you would expect because the barriers in the labour market, the general barriers in the labour market are just too high and people can't overcome them. And, they, and of course, you know, you've got to, you've got to get up, you've got to feed your children, you've got to, you know, take, take things forward. So I think uh, disabled people and blind people particularly, you're going to see, you know, you'll see in the statistics, a higher number of people working for themselves. And I think it's a good thing. Problem is working for yourself is harder and they need support. And, organizations like mine we, we 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 are set up to support them and provide them with business planning fundraising support advice and guidance to so, support them in in that journey really so That's michael awesome. if, if you were to give a message to employers right mm. now about people who are visually impaired mm. what would be the message what what would and what is going to give more people hope? Because the government has come out this week and said they want 5 million disabled people in work by, I think, 2027. So mm. what do you think about the message and what do you think about the government message this week as well? Yeah, well, <clears throat> my message will be twofold, Ian. I would say that first, blind and visually impaired people 
they should be focused on putting a plan in place for them to uh, take their business forward. Self-employment is a realistic route for them to uh, achieve their goals, uh, generate income and and put a business in place. And it's a realistic thing. It, uh, I, people like myself, but there are, there are other organisations that can help them put that in place. That's the first thing. Secondly, the government and Job Centre Plus and all the other government agencies uh, uh, do need to do what they what it says on the tin and and uh, make a reasonable adjustment and put investment in place and f i'm asking banks funders and other agencies to fund uh, blind and vision impaired businesses and people and individuals and support them in their endeavors going forward but there is a big hope because the economy is going to bounce back Ian is coming back we are going to come out of this pandemic 2022 I mean, my, my, this is my, here's my prediction Ian 2023 the economy is going to be boost and boom and grow significantly and we will be corrected by 2023 so I think we're going to have a, a great uh, economic uh, growth uh, economic bounce back and this is the opportunity for businesses, whether you've got a disability or not, to really take that those first steps into self-employment. And and I and we, we we just want to promote enterprise as a positive way forward for wealth creation for, for you know for all people. But and, and what about the government uh, really dictates that uh, by 2027 they want five million? Well, is this the, something that's possible? Uh, well, I think it's possible if the government really play, uh, uh, look. The government, we, we they've got their they've got their hands full with all sorts of stuff, and the pandemic didn't help us, and so on. But if they are determined and dedicated and 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 focused, then there's no reason why we can't get more and more and more disabled people in uh, and five million disabled people into work and into self-employment. There's no reason why we can't do that. It's just a question of whether the government is serious about it or is it just rhetoric? Is it just words? We need to, I don't know. And I hope it's not. I'm going to do my little bit, my 1%, 2% work to try and help people. Well, I think that's no. amazing, Mike. I think the government needs to keep working with you. Yes. You'll keep them on the straight and narrow. Yes. And we're all going to be, well, hopefully things are looking good for 2023, you say, yes. which we all want. Yes, I think so. Um, and, you know, onwards and upwards, I yes, say. I do. Fantastic. Keep up the good work. Thank um, you. You're an inspiration, yeah, I think. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And finally, Michael, just tell us a little bit about MA Spooners, what, what, what you actually do right now, yes. how people can get in contact with you. Yes, um, yeah, well, I'm, uh, yes, yeah, so MA Spooner Limited, we're, so it's www.maspooner.co.uk. We're a consultancy, we do, we're a business analyst, we do training, research, and mentoring and support. And you can get in touch with us on 0207 to seven 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 nine nine um but we've got you go on the website and uh contact us uh, you know by email admin at maspooner.co.uk you can talk to us i'm happy to talk to anybody that needs help support uh and can you know just want to just have a chat or even just want to talk about their business idea where we can sort of work out whether it's a viable option or not ian so that's really what I want to do. So that's my contact details. And they've got us, and we're on LinkedIn, we're on Twitter, and we're on Facebook as well. And it doesn't necessarily mean vision impaired people. No, anybody. So, so, so you're working, and I know you work a lot with communities, communities as well. Uh, communities, any business, women-led business, disabled-led business, black-led, BAME-led businesses, uh, anybody uh, in the economy that wants help, we're a consultancy, that, or we're just in the community that's out there to help people. Um, you know, well, create wealth through their own efforts. That's what we're trying to do. Michael, thank you so much for today. Thank Thanks, you. Ian. Thanks, Helena. I thank really appreciate you, Michael. having Great. you on the show again. And, and, and get me back here when, when we can, because I'm 
always happy to come back on. Excellent. We, we will invite you back, definitely. Right. Thank you very much. Well, wasn't that another great show today? Very good, very interesting. I learned and I some think, insightful uh, you know, we've had news. some good news, some good royal news. Uh, the Red Cross as well, and yeah. how to uh, join the Red Absolutely. Cross. Absolutely, and I love hearing all these stories. There's so many charities out there that need support. Um, as well so keep on shining a light on on those this is the way forward isn't it absolutely so it's been a good a good time absolutely Thank you. so from helen and myself um this is a show that really tries to highlight communities charities good works and so forth as well so from the great britain show in conjunction with voice of london and alb uk television it's good afternoon and have a great weekend and I'm sure Helena will say the same. Yeah, absolutely. We will see you next week. Thank you very much for watching. Take care.